Hey, okay, good morning, Liberty. If you want to stand with us, we'll do our first hymn, The Lee of the Valley.
and pass the peace. Peace be with you and also with you. We'll start announcements in just a minute. <laughs>
Good morning. We're happy to have each of you with us this morning. We're glad to see such a big crowd on homecoming. And uh, we thank you for coming to our homecoming special Sunday. Um, announcements, obviously today's homecoming and the silent auction. And uh, I've seen a bunch of uh, the items for the silent auction over in the fellowship hall. So, and then uh, October 14th is our fish fry from 4 to 7. And October 29th is our harvest party. So you want to make sure you remind people of the fish fry. Um, sometimes early invites keeps you from conflicting with other things on people's schedules. And it ups our attendance. So, is there any other announcements? Oh, I'm there's, oh, it's over there. Goodness. They've hidden my mic. Yeah, it's really hidden. <laughs> there you go, sir. I got many other problems. I got many other problems. Dick can tell you all about my, all my problems. Okay, I guess I need this. <laughs> Rock said I didn't need the microphone. Uh, I would like to invite everybody to Circle Silent Auction, and we will also have a cash and carry room if you want to take an item today, and that's going to be in the children's church room, so check that out also. And I would also like to add that on October 1st, it's up on the screen, that Helen Beatty will be celebrating her 100th birthday. And that's a very, very special milestone in someone's life. And uh, church members are invited, and that will be in the fellowship hall from 2 until 4. I have a strange announcement which has nothing to do with the church, but <laughs> Thursday night, about 10 o'clock, I understand it came over the police scanner that uh, a house at 1800 Valley View Drive had been driven through a, by a motor vehicle. That's my house. <laughs> but that was wrong. The house, was, the, the, the story is true. The, a guy did drive through a house in my neighborhood, but the house number is 1889. And the, he really did drive all the way through the house. And I, I don't know the status of the house, and I don't know my neighbor's name, but uh, she wasn't hurt. She happened to be in the bathroom and had just got out of bed and went to the bathroom about a few minutes before that and her mattress is still laying out in the yard. I don't know whether the house is totaled or not. He, he had overindulged that uh, half moon. Um, I just want to say that the Jubilee Christmas applications are going out. They're available to be picked up. So if you know of anyone or family that needs help this Christmas, um, you, can, you can contact me or I'll put it on our Facebook page where you can pick them up. So you can pick up an application. Do you remember when they're due, Lori? They're, it's November something. Probably the beginning of November. Okay. Because... It yeah. takes time to organize Yes, yeah, probably the beginning of November. Doesn't want it. They're due uh, by 5 p.m. November 3rd. So if you know somebody, they've got some time to fill them out. Um, I just opened up that app. Um, and you'll notice in the back, there are some used books. If anybody's interested in participating in the book club um, on November 5th, there are books in the back. There are two that are cheaper because they came a little worse for wear than the others. So they have little notes on them, but otherwise they're $10. You can just toss that in the offering plate. Um, and, or you can get your own in whatever format you would like, but um, we will discuss the book on November 5th. 
Any other announcements? We'll now have our happy dollars. Could you keep them kids quiet? <laughs> a noisy church is, a, is a, a, an alive church. You can't see it specifically, but if you look really close at that picture, you will see that Alyssa and Zach got engaged last weekend. Yay! She's so excited. She is so excited. And she, I said, is it okay if I tell everybody? And she said, shout it from the rooftops. I'm so excited. So, yeah. Lulu B. Ayu. <laughs> I lost the other day at football, <laughs> so I've not been very happy. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. <laughs> now, Eric, normally the new fathers put in money every week for like a year. $10. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I made a little extra money this week. Judson's tennis team has won all three invitationals. They are now 15 and one, but they've got a tough week with four more matches before the sectional. That's quite a record. I got one for Riley's first volleyball game, which he was awesome. They worked really hard. Another one for a second volleyball game, which uh, they were playing some older kids. And uh, they, the fifth grade team against fifth, sixth, and seventh graders. So they, they were tough and uh, we're real proud of Riley. Another one for Dustin, who spread mulch over my flower bed. He's a busy guy. It's my birthday, so thank you. Thanks, He's setting a bad example for the other husbands, isn't he? I'm glad my wife didn't hear that. It's recorded and put on the internet, though. Um, one for the fact that we saw our senior, uh, Eastern High School senior granddaughter compete with her marching band at Northwestern yesterday, so I don't know yet how they turned out. I mean, they. There's classes A, B, C, D, so they're in class B, but did a terrific job. Very proud of her. I'm, uh, I always call out, go Hannah! <laughs> and then um, we had a neighbor who I had only seen from a distance. She's an Oriental American gal and came over yesterday, knocked on the back door and um, shared Asian pears that they grow in their yard and bag of them. So that was just great. I intend to uh, get her actual address because it doesn't face us to have and send a thank you card at least. I mean, I thank her in person, but you know, we should all do things like that, right? So that was a great way to get to know her. So <laughs> not wanting to part with her. That's a Gary. Somebody's excited about their happy dollar. First report from school, an A minus and A plus. Did you get somebody else's card? I always look for a better one to take home. <laughs> I won't um, name names, but my happy dollar is for somebody who may be turning 70 this week. I'm not looking in that direction or anything, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
join together in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for today. For even when it's cooler out, which Pastor Mariah loves, um, but others may be chilly, we feel your warmth in our hearts, guiding and directing us. Lord, we pray as we celebrate our history, we remember the one who holds our history in his hands. Thank you so much for the life you have given us and the history of this church. God, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite our candle lighters up at this time.
Oh my gosh. <laughs> you should be the Yeah. You can, on the, you can sit on the you can sit on the pews, honey. If I just had a baby, I wouldn't be able to walk. If I just had a baby, it'd be a miracle, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah that wouldn't be a miracle. Did you have a good week? Yeah. How's your mouth? It's it good. It, it's hurting a little bit on the roof of my mouth. It's still trying. But it doesn't keep you from talking. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's amazing that, uh, too, these kids know what to do. By lighting the candles and carrying the hymn books, and uh, you know, what better gift could parents give kids to bring them to church and let them know what Christ is all about? You did a good job this morning, didn't you? And Aaron and I have decided Dick's all time picking on him. Dick's just jealous because he's not, yeah, he's not, he's not 16 and good looking anymore. Is he? But, but he, been married to me for 60 years either, so that makes a difference <laughs> in what kind of condition you're in. Well, you know, there were two Native Americans, and that uh, a Native American is a full-blooded Indian, and they were in New York, and um, they were at, right at noon, where all the, the, all the horns and all, you know, all the bustle in New York City, and one of them said, I hear a cricket. And the other one says, that's crazy. You cannot hear a cricket with all this noise going on. And so he kept listening and kept listening. And he went to this round cement uh, flower pot. And he uh, spread the bushes and there was a cricket. And the guy with him says, you must have ears like no other one. And he says, no. He says, it's what you're listening to. It's what you hear. And he says, let me show you. And he put, he got in his pocket and he got some coins and he dropped them on the cement. And you know, people stopped and they heard those coins dropping on the cement. And he says, you know, that's the way it is with God. Some people say there's no God, but we got to listen to him and we got to look for him to know that God is there. So let's open our hearts and let's listen to God so we will know that he's there. Okay. Dear God, thank you so much for these children. And please help us grown-ups grown -ups to teach them to listen to you. You are alive, God, and we believe in you with our whole hearts. In your holy name we pray. Amen. We have a special homecoming treat um, of our bell choir. And so... I'm going to invite them to come up as the kiddos are grabbing their snacks. You don't have to rush. You can get your stuff and get into place. But we will have our bell choir play a song for us next.
together as a congregation and Abraham Kirtley there's one of his descendants was here last week they were sitting in the back over by the, the Kirtley spot um, Abraham Kirtley was the one that deeded land for for the original log cabin church to be built um, and that wasn't until um, 1895 no not 1895 18 well uh, 1858 is when that was. Um, and then, so the church over time, it had started out meeting in houses, and then it went to the log cabin, and eventually the log cabin wasn't big enough. And at that point also, they, like, everything was primitive. So, like, no lights, no, you know, no heating or cooling or anything like that. Um, but they eventually moved into the A-frame church, which, if you look at pictures in the back, it's the white church um, that you see in photos in the backyard, or backyard, back in the foyer. Um, that was built in 1882, um, and eventually they outgrew that one as well, and needed to build the, the brick church, the church that burned is what all of you call it. Um, the, that church was built in 1922 and it was burnt in 1994. But when you think about the history and how much has happened and the ebb and flow and that there are some families that are still in this church that from when it was first just gathered as people in a home, it's so cool to think about. To think that in the history of this church predates the Civil War um, in some, some portion because um, we have Confederate and Union soldiers, both in the um, cemetery over here. And that was a whole kerfuffle, <laughs> um, it, having both sides buried, because, you know, Indiana was um, a Union state, and so the idea of burying somebody from the other side up here was just controversial. Um, but even those divisions, the church has continued on through. And so, um, the other fun facts I learned was that they didn't get an organ until 1895, okay? So they founded as a church in 1854. It wasn't until 1895 that they had an instrument. 
that they, it said in the, the histories that they used a tuning fork to know like what pitch to hit to sing. Uh, so, and then a piano wasn't even included until 1916. Just, these are just some cool things to remind us of the history that we've gone through, that we have our brick church, this was the building from before, um, our current building, and that we inherited this space from the people before us. They opened doors for us to have a space to worship, just like we are preparing this space for the next generation as well. It is actively the church of these little biddies here too. It's not going to be their church. It is their church now today, which is why they get to make wiggles and giggles and noises, happy or sad, because it's their space to meet and worship God as well. But I just want us to have this moment of celebration over liberty and the fact that we as a group of fellow believers have consisted on to worship God and to grow in our faith. So thank you for coming to celebrate and we will uh, christen this moment with some delicious food um, in, in just a little while. And we will also be selling shirts soon. Um, the order form got delayed. I was going to have it out today, but it got delayed. We'll be selling some new Liberty shirts if anybody wants some swag. Um, hopefully we'll have that out by next week, just so you guys know as well. But. Happy homecoming, and we're so glad you're here to celebrate with us today. I'm going to pass it over to Gary to get us back into our routine. We're now going to have our prayer request. Um, is there anybody that we need an update on the current prayer list that's on the back of your bulletin? Um, I have one. I talked to Shirley Miller. Um, Wednesday and well Tuesday and Wednesday um, she was not feeling up for a visit she was just feeling poorly um, but she so just continuing to pray for her like some days she's got good days and bad days and it just so happened that when I talked to her she was not having a great day so prayers for continued prayers for Shirley do we know anything about Jane and how she's doing Jamie is an optimistic woman those of you that don't know that she's had breast cancer three separate times now um, and had surgery to remove some of that um, recently. Um, her case is so rare because of the large gaps between each relapse um, that they want, they've asked her if they could include her in some studies so that hopefully that they'll gain knowledge to help others in the future. Um, so pain has been her biggest struggle for management. Um, so, and that she'll have to do radiation soon once her, all of her surgery spots heal. So prayers for her as she deals with radiation to come, but also the pain she's dealing with right now. Um, but she said she's got an amazing support system of her kids and friends that are keeping their eyes on her as well. Gary, yeah. Who did? My brother. Your brother. Yeah. And he's had 10 stents put in now. But um, he's pretty good. About an hour after they did it, he was ordering breakfast and drinking coffee. So he's been on around. What's his name? His first name? Bill. 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 So Nan, Nan's brother, Bill, it, um, had three stints put in this week. Looks like Denny, Denny has some. Is there any others? Denny? Okay, uh, uh, a long time friend of ours who um, was in Amakai Gospel. Uh, John was true. Passed away. No relation to you, I don't think. No. <laughs> but with the, the we did. Us folks will never claim each other. <laughs> I figured she was 99 when she died, with Anna Mae Ribnauer, uh, just Anna Mae R. Gondolino, her family, that was in the Tribune. 
And um, their funerals are Tuesday. I was that one too. Okay. I was that one. Flood victims and families and first responders in Libya. That is so terrible what's going on there. You know, pray God is in the midst of all of it. Thousands died and they're looking for, I think, 10,000 died at least. And then they're looking for at least 11,000. So, a, a dam broke, I think was what it was. And this morning God led me to uh, write children's children's children athletes safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so many football games, Brantley's playing uh, ball ball baseball this afternoon at 4.30. Letty is two at one, but we saw Letty last week, and so we'll see, see him this week, I guess. Um, but yeah. thank you. You know, we have the Miller family on here, but both Joyce and her husband, Bill, have tested positive for COVID. So they've just had a quite a long run of not feeling well. So this is the latest. God be with each of these people, uh, especially the major tragedies that's been happening in other countries, uh, with thousands dying. We ask that you watch over our sick and shut-ins and help each of their days become a little brighter. And with the families of those uh, who have recently deceased. Amen.
But why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you look down on your brother or sister? We will all stand in front of the judgment seat of God because it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. I'm going to keep going and read one more verse for you. So stop judging each other. Instead, this is what you should decide. Never put a stumbling block or obstacle in the way of your brother or sister. Well, once again, happy homecoming. I'm glad you are here to worship with us today. Um, today we are in our second installment of our forgiveness series, which is also coincidentally the last of it. We just did two short weeks in Matthew 18, and uh, it's we're going to dig in deep today, so be ready. It's going to be great. Whew, if you haven't been reading along in there... Jesus packs a punch today. But before we dive into what Jesus has to say, I want you to recount your own memories of apologies and forgiveness. Can you think of any circumstances where your parents coached you either in giving an apology or receiving an apology? Any advice that they gave you or coaching? Both. Uh -huh. I went to the local, uh, kind of like the grocery store, and helped myself to some candy on the counter. <laughs> and my folks found out, and they me go back to the parlor to land the cake. Oh, so Bo um, <clears throat> had some sticky fingers as a, as a little munchkin, um, and his parents had him go back and apologize. They made me go back, so they didn't go with me. Yeah, made him <laughs> go back. Yes, Mom? Oh, and then he got to do the, and it's so fun when the lessons we learn, we get to pass on to the next generation. Okay, so. My sister and I had a guy that was just a creepy guy in our class, and so we decided one day to throw a snowball at his car, but we put a rock on the I was Obviously, he was driving, so I was old enough to know better. <laughs> Oh, uh, mom made a big mistake uh, by throwing a snowball with a rock in a guy's moving at a guy's moving car, and then her parents required her to go apologize to his house. He ended up in prison. Well, she said her sister was with her, um, and the, the guy was creepy, was the word my mother used. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> I think about some of the instructions about um, say it like you mean it, you know? Not just, sorry, you know, but come on, say it like you mean it, or you know, look them in the eyes, or whatever. And, uh, what I really appreciate is there's a teacher that made this how to apologize chart. I've shown you it before, and I realize this is too small to read or for you to read from your spot, but it goes through seven steps of an apology. So no longer am I just saying I'm sorry, but we're getting to the nitty gritty. You first say what you're sorry for, then you say why it was wrong, you accept full responsibility, ask how to make amends, commit to not doing it again, ask for forgiveness, and then thank them. And, and I have to admit, I know this seems like, oh, this is so many steps, but I wonder what it teaches us at a young age to, to see the full impact of our actions and how they affect somebody and the ownership that we take for it. And what some of us are the 
not child generations, those of us, I realize I'm not the oldest in the room and I'm not the youngest in the room, but how our lives could have looked different if we all had learned good ways to apologize. There's the, my favorite on the bottom are different examples of not apologies. I'm sorry, but. Anytime there's a but in your apology, it's not an apology. Or, I'm sorry you feel that way. Also not an apology. So this is a more intense form of coaching, rather than just um, circumstances where you have to go and say, I'm sorry, uh, and make amends that way. Um, even though this is for kids, I feel like we as adults can be um, storing these for our own lessons. Last week we talked about accountability. We talked about um, the steps of making things right and what happens if a person refuses to be held accountable and the result of your relationship changing. Um, this week we're going to continue the conversation talking about forgiveness because God bless Peter, but he asks an extremely honest question about the limits of forgiveness. And Jesus gives a very detailed response back in the form of a parable. <laughs> so we are going to be reading in Matthew 18 again this week. This is verses 21 through 35 that we're going to look at together. <clears throat> then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Should I forgive them as many as seven times? Jesus says, not just seven times, but rather as many as 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, they brought to him, brought to him a servant who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. Because the servant didn't have enough to pay it back, the master ordered that he should be sold along with his wife and children and everything he had, and that the proceeds should be used as payment. But the servant fell down, kneeled before him and said, please be patient with me, I'll pay you back. The master had compassion on the servant and released him and forgave the loan. When that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 coins. He grabbed him around the throat and said, pay me back what you owe me. Then his fellow servant fell down and begged him, please be patient with me. I'll pay you back. But he refused. <clears throat> Instead, he threw him into prison until he paid back his debt. When his fellow servants saw what happened, they were deeply offended. They came and told their master all that had happened. His master called the first servant and said, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you appealed to me. Shouldn't you also have mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had mercy on you? His master was furious and handed him over to the guard responsible for punishing prisoners until he had paid the whole debt. My Heavenly Father will also do the same for you if you don't forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. <laughs> Judge Judy or things like that, those are, yes, people suing each other on those courts. It's, you know, no matter how much somebody owed me, I don't know if I could uh, put myself up to standing in front of Judge Judy, because I know I would just feel like an idiot at the end of it, you know, just based on how things go. <clears throat> so this is a conversation continuing on from the conversation last week where um, Jesus gave very detailed steps about the process of um, healing a relationship. So to remember, the disciples are around at this point. That could mean the 12, or it could mean more than that. Um, and, it, and also there were kids hanging out there too. 
We found out from earlier in the chapter that Jesus had invited kids around. So there's a wide variety of people listening to this conversation about um, forgiveness. My favorite part about the fact that Peter asked this question is his brother Andrew is also a disciple. And so he's like, um, Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive my brother and sister? I mean, not, not Andrew, not the one sitting right next to me. Um, I just, I find that that funny, that, that moment, like, was it pointed? Did he have a, yeah, did, did he have like a tone to his voice? Or was it, did he think he had the right answer? Because um, what's fascinating in Jewish culture of that time is that numbers held a significance to them. Not just, um, not just some numbers, but there are multiple numbers that you can look at that all have a significance. And seven is one of those. Seven is considered like this perfect number, the, the number of God. It's supposed to be very special, right? And so when Peter answers his own question, he's like, is it seven times? It seems like he's offering the Sunday school answer. Like the, not every answer in Sunday school is Jesus, God, or the Holy Spirit, you know? Like, that's what it seems like he's offering. Is it seven, God? Is seven Jesus? Perfect. Um, and Jesus' response to him is no, not seven times, not perfection, but 77 times. Way past, exceeding excessively perfection. 77 times. That's how long, how many times you're supposed to forgive. Now, in some of the other gospels, Jesus makes it a math question and says, seven times 70. And that's how, how many times we're supposed to do it. And it's like, oh, great. I have to do math and forgive. <laughs> <sighs> um, but either way, there's this idea of an overabundance of mercy that we are supposed to pour out onto somebody else. And he then pinpoints that lesson using a parable, a parable about a king and some debt. Um, but I want you to know, like, every time you hear Jesus start a phrase with the kingdom of heaven is like, he usually, you can translate that also as God works this way. Um, and so he's trying to, to give a picture or a scenario to help understand how God works. Now, I know that if you're like me, um, that's a little bit scary of a thought because you think about the ending. Well, there's a guy that ends up, like, tortured in prison. That's how God is. And we forget like the first part of the overwhelming mercy and forgiveness. Um, so we, we learn that the servant A, I'm going to call him servant A because there's a servant B coming up, owes the king an absorbent amount um, of debt. Um, they say 10,000 bags of gold, right? Um, somebody tried to calculate, calculate this, and um, every coin is supposed to be represent a day's wage. So, um, 10,000 bags of coins would be like 60 million days' wages, or 165,000 years of wages. Okay, that's how much servant A owes. And, yeah, yeah, hoofta. And, um, and he comes and he's like, I'll pay it back. No, it's not going to pay it back. But he, he's committed. He's like, I'll pay it back. Just give me more time. And the king forgives it. The guy doesn't even ask for forgiveness. But the, the king releases him from his debt and sets him free. You would think if you owe 165,000 years worth of salary... Something inside of you would feel different, right? But instead, he goes out and finds servant B, who owes him a hundred days' wages. One hundred sixty-five thousand years, a hundred days' wages, and he strangles him and throws him in jail to to pay it up. Give me that money. For some reason, the compassion that he received did not pass on to the next person. That overabundant, excessive forgiveness that was poured out on him 
the 70 times 7, the 77 level of forgiveness was put on him, but he did not pass it on to the next person. And instead held him to um, a higher standard than he held himself and threw him in prison to boot. And so the king finds out about it and says, you weren't changed by my mercy? Fine, don't be changed. Sit in prison and, and hang out there until you pay off that 165,000 years worth of debt. God poured out mercy and mercy and mercy and mercy. And instead of his servant being changed by it, he was still holding on to greed and judgment. And so God's like, all right, that's what you want. Go ahead and hang out with it. Hang out in the thing you chose. And so if you were the first time around hearing this, you're like, oh, God put that guy in prison until he rots. But really, that guy put himself there. He chose to not be transformed by the overwhelming compassion and mercy of the king. And that led to this place of him writing his own death certificate. Something about God is supposed to change us. Transform us. I mean, you even hear in uh, our scripture reading for today how Paul is coaching these, the Christians in Rome on how to um, manage consuming meat that was cooked, sacrificed to idols. Like, can we eat that meat or not? He's not just teasing vegetarians and saying that they're morally weak. That's not what's going on there. It's, about a, it's a conversation about idolatry. Um, but setting aside the whole conversation about food, you see once again the responsibility of the person who is more spiritually mature. The more spiritually mature one is supposed to set an example to be like God, providing grace and compassion to the one that's less mature, to not provide a stumbling block. There's another place in Paul's words where he says, you know, just because we have freedom doesn't mean we get to do whatever we want. But instead, we, we give up our freedom so that others may know Jesus. And in this same way here, the servant may have been, you know, owed money by servant B. But servant A experienced transformation. His, he was set free. That should have changed the way he interacted with servant B. And I wonder about ourselves and how we may struggle to allow God's mercy to transform us. Now, Paul highlights this with a discussion about stumbling blocks and that those of, of a more mature faith have a responsibility to not put stumbling blocks in place for the ones of less maturity. And I think we struggle with that, both in forgiveness um, and even asking for forgiveness, in receiving it and asking for it. Um, we instead want to keep people to our own expectations. To hold them to our standards rather than God's standards. But last week we learned that the responsibility we carry in forgiveness um, is that we, we hold fellow Christians mutually accountable. There's a relationship there. When you are of like faith, you have this um, level of accountability you hold each other to. But eventually, if they, if they refuse to, to follow the same faith, if they don't want to be held to that same standard, you approach them differently. And today, we see that we are to approach these situations with humility and with overabundance of mercy. Because we have been given an overabundance of mercy. There's a balance to forgiveness. There's accountability for those willing to be held accountable. When they don't want to be held accountable, the dynamic changes. 
And then there's also the person who does decide to be held accountable that we pour mercy onto. There's two different scenarios that Jesus unfolds in this conversation where adults and kids are listening in. We are examples to those, whether they are as old as us or maybe not as spiritually mature as us. We set the example of compassion with apologies. We recognize our own experience of restoration and our need for forgiveness. Our history informs our actions and where we go from this point forward. Liberty is also one of those, those stories of history where we learn from the past and we know how to move forward. We've been through the muck and we can help somebody on their way out providing that pathway and saying, I've been in this dark place before. I've been the one to mess up. I know how to set things right. Follow me, buddy. We've got our way out. That is the gift of church. Not just a place for social clubs, but the, the support structure that helps you continue to develop your faith. Forgiveness is just one of those examples of how we develop our faith. We may have just studied in Matthew 18 for two weeks, but as we continue going on with our scripture studies, each week we have an opportunity to continue to grow in our faith. And to eat some food, because, you know, Paul said that you're supposed to eat, right? We eat for God. I think Baptists are good at that, eating for God. So, with that being said, I want to offer a prayer and I'm also going to bless the food right now um, so that by the time we get in there, we'll be ready to go. I don't want to hold anybody back from their food. All right? So, gracious God, we thank you so much that whether we live or we die, that we serve you. Whether we eat or abstain, we serve you. Whether we are the apologizer or the forgiver, we serve you. Help us to see each other with humble eyes of overwhelming mercy, forgiving to 77 times. Bless this food to our bodies that we are about to partake in and may it help nourish not only our bodies but our souls for the work you have set before us. God, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand with me as we sing our closing benediction. You're invited to hold hands with your neighbors as you feel comfortable.